Welcome to the Robert Show. We are here at Fling Forward 2024, and look who I have with me, Stephen, who is the founder at Tree State and also the co-creator of Flink. Super Thank excited you for to me. yeah, super excited to have you here. I I know you've been in back-to-back -back talks. You've been you know meeting the community, and obviously we've been seeing all the great work that you've done over the years. Uh, so uh, super excited to chat with you and learn more about uh, Flink. Uh, but just talking about Flink, obviously it goes back to the origins. Uh, so I'm kind of wanting to learn a little about uh, how it all started, uh, what was the focus, and uh, you know what's what's the future as well. But let's start with you know how it all started. Yeah, Flink goes back a long time. I think Flink has a project by the name Flink is back to 2014. So this is the 10th year anniversary right now. Right. And um, so we're it was a, it's actually a university research project spin-off, right? So it was some um, a, a work that I worked on during my PhD together with a postdoc and a couple of other students that we forked out from a university project into an Apache open source project. Um, it took a while for Flink to become what it is today, as mm. a stream processing system, or actually these days a unified batch and stream processing systems yep. a system. Um, so the times 2014-15 was, I guess, if you've, if you've been <laughs> in the big data space, long enough, <laughs> you might remember this is the sort of, the, uh, probably still the Hadoop era, Hadoop I think Spark era. was right. very new at, at that point in time, but mm. like starting to get it established. And um, it turned out like we saw, okay, batch, batch use cases start to be like mature and people, you know, start, start to be happy with the solutions that they had. But there is this type of use cases the, you know, that we now talk about is this like real time data right. use cases that really didn't have any good solution at all. There was Apache Storm, if anybody still remembers that. Yeah. And, um, and then Spark had the Spark streaming edition, but what the ecosystem was completely lacking was a solution that was like high throughput, low latency, and still actual correctness, like exactly once correctness just didn't exist. Nobody knew how to do it back then. And mm. in 2015, sort of Flink came up with a good idea for this with this um, yeah. stateful, stateful streaming with checkpoints. And that kind of is, I guess, how it all started. That is what people liked about it and why they started using Thanks it. Thanks for sharing those insights. Uh, it's fantastic. I'm kind of also curious to learn a little about, you know, the challenges. So how did you and your team kind of uh, face, solve those biggest challenges uh, that came through and uh, when you were obviously developing Flink uh, in the early stages? Uh, how did that kind of, uh, you know, how did you all kind of come through? Uh, mm -hmm. those challenges? Would you like to share something on that? Yeah. Um, I mean, there's always technical challenges, right? Like, to make this whole thing work was not easy. I'd, it just sounds very it sounds very casual or simple these days. Like, look, you put a checkpoint <laughs> algorithm in there and it's done. I think this actually worked till this day to actually, like, really still fine-tune it and make it, right. um, you know, Im improve the corner cases and so on. I think the biggest challenges were usually around, um, you know, you have to think about it like this. Th there were like six people dropping out of a university in Germany that nobody's ever heard of and trying to get this project and go up against like, you know, all the Silicon Valley projects and so yeah. on. So the, f the first thing was, uh, the biggest one was always, I guess, a credibility one. So one yeah. of the, that's also one of the reasons why we never started this as an, an open source project that we kept owning, but we, it was clear it had to go to Apache to get a little bit of like, you know, credibility exactly. by association right. from there. And then we had to win some early users that could really know with their brand and logo True. kind of prove that this works. So I would say one of the sort of pivotal points for Flink was when Uber and Netflix picked it up. Exactly. And this is like, you know, they, like to this day, they have two of the like largest installations um, in, yeah. the, in the world, helped us mature the system, but also proved to other people, like this is actually serious, it's not a toy project. True, true. I think uh, that kind of helps uh, us understand, you know, how it all, happened but you know it's also about the validation that you got from you know the big enterprises out there and you'll continue to you know obviously run in that direction as well there are so, so many bigger companies who've been using flink i've been talking to a lot of people who are enterprise leaders i was just talking to someone from pinterest and they're using flink uh, i was talking to booking.com they're using flink so there are a lot of huge customers yeah. right yeah it's that it's almost the most fun thing that like every day you open your app to call an Uber, you, you scroll through Netflix or like even you, I've learned this morning, like if you turn on your heating, it consumes gas, like, you know, some of the, the way that the prices are computed and so on, it goes like through, through the project we built. And this is, this, this wow. is fun. <laughs> it, it's, you know, obviously uh, you've built it and you've kind of created it. You would like for us as well, when if we, if I'm at Flink Forward and I kind of go out and book an Uber, I'm like, 
these guys use Flink, <laughs> right? Yeah. So that's the fun part. Yeah. Uh, exactly, that's the fun part. Like you keep kind of indirectly using your own thing, but it runs in the background of your day-to-day -day apps. True, yeah. true. And proud of, you know, obviously what you build. So that's awesome. Uh, I'm also, talk just on this topic itself, I'm kind of interested to also know a little about uh, the market and what was Flink's impact on the market. So when Flink was introduced, what made it stand out in the stream processing la landscape? Would you like to share a little about that? Yeah, um, it goes back to this, um, you know, this time when the uh, the only things that were there were like Storm and Spark streaming. Mm. And it was pretty clear if, if stream, so stream processing was actually back then considered not a, a correct thing. It was considered like an approximation tool. Mm. So you could get some approximate real time data and then you would actually have a slower batch layer to really compute the accurate results. Right. And like you. And then um, I think Flink's contribution was kind of proving that no, the real-time layer can actually be like fast and accurate at the same time. Like yep. by now, this seems kind of obvious. There's so many projects that do that. Like Flink does it, Kafka Streams does it in a different way. Then there are all the other stream processors that have one or the other version of achieving that. But back then, this was like far from obvious. Like people were arguing, no, no, real-time can actually not be correct. It can be on only be fast. And, yeah. and sort of, I think that was Flink's contribution proving that's not true. It can actually be fast and correct. Yeah, I think uh, that's awesome, and thanks for sharing that. Uh, also curious to know a little about you know the journey. How has how have things evolved over the years since the time that you have co-created uh, Flink, and what have you learned about the open source community? How has it influenced the leadership? Now you are also founder of a company, right? So how how does it all work? Yeah, that that that's probably. An, an hour long uh, answer <laughs> that I have to give you. No, but like in short, maybe um, open open source is incredibly challenging and rewarding at the same point in time. The the journey that we took was, you know, we basically the, the whole the whole story. Also, I think it's one of the reasons why Flink has this like truly global community with lots of actual backers mm. in the more Western Hemisphere, a lot of backers in the Eastern Hemisphere, and so on. And the um, it's it's a great way to bring bring actually people together and collaborate like and they they bring very different right. different mindset and properties and, and and skills and views on things like from from the different parts of the world that it's as a, it's an one one of, one of the ways to really get the best out of the whole world like when with a global open source community yeah it's probably the i would say the single most rewarding thing in, in everything to see how this has all unfolded that's awesome i'm kind of also curious to learn a little about real estate what do you guys do there what's the aim yeah, so um, fr if you're coming from the Flink side, or l let's say, you know, stream processing side in general, stream processing, you can think of it as analytics over events, almost like, you know, an OLAP database, but, you know, with, with events. Mm, <laughs> okay. Know, computes queries based on, on, on changing events, changes output, right? But it's, right. it's very analytical. Restate is basically the other side of things. When we looked at what, what ap other applications do people build on events, what do they build on Kafka, on, on, on logs and so on, where do the stuff that gets computed in Flink end up? It get gets ends up in some sort of microservices, right? And if you right. try to build durable microservices, that's a terribly hard thing to do, like still today. Yeah. I mean, the term microservice blue is, doesn't come from nothing. And there's like lots of factors contributing right. to that, but right. just like the complexity of reliable microservices is one. And, and Restate kind of takes the idea and say, you know, stream processing has this magic resilience and correctness. Like it's ex exactly once and you don't really code for it. It just like knows how to do it. Like, can we get a bit of that magic to distributed microservices as well to the transactional side of event-driven applications? Mm. And Restate is, is basically that, like stream processing magic for your transactional microservices. That's awesome. I think uh, it's very interesting and very, uh, timely wise as well, it is something which is pretty hot in this space. So you'll, you'll have built something pretty interesting there. Uh, also want a little bit of advice for the developers and the engineers out there uh, who are getting into the streaming space, the data streaming, data processing space. Uh, what, what advice would you give them uh, if they're just starting the journey or if they are at least a few years in the game? Yeah. Um I think there's maybe two things. If you have an idea and you think it's really good, don't be discouraged if people don't immediately like it <laughs> because it's it's going to happen. Like we had this a lot when we started our company. Yeah. Like no nobody actually wanted to believe that we can build anything because we we're not the typical profile of there's at least two founders that have done something before and a big Silicon Valley investor in this. 
And but you know, and it took us a bit of time and iteration and pivot, mm. but you can actually get there. If you think you, c you have a, a good idea, stay with it for a while, even if it doesn't catch doesn't catch on on day one. Yeah, maybe that's the first one. But the, and the second one is maybe something that is is kind of timely with all the AI stuff coming up. Um, and I've, I feel this personally as I'm trying to learn new programming languages with the help mm. of AI. Um, I think it's very worthwhile to still go deep in the details and and go deep in the basics. Like, you know, you still want to, I think, understand the principles of how a database work, even if the AI can write the SQL statements for you. Because mm. ultimately, this is what's going to differentiate you as a as a developer in the end and allow you to also understand the nasty corner cases that maybe the AI doesn't get right. If you don't have that, then maybe yeah. there's really diminishing totally. um, differentiation between you and the next AI programmer. So I think it's more worth than ever to go deep in the fundamentals and... and, and yeah. yeah, no, I love those insights and definitely patience is the key for sure in terms of what when you're kind of building and then it kind of y'all are uh, the real examples of it. Y'all stayed by what y'all uh, were wanting to prove and then y'all have evolved over the years as well, right? You need to evolve with time. So that is important too. But uh, I think those are great points, uh, Stephen. One quick question uh, for our audience and last one, which is if folks want to reach out to you, learn more about Restate, learn more about Flink or anything else in the open source community as well, where can they do that? Um, yeah, you can you can find Restate at Restate.dev. You can find me on on, on Twitter. Um, just shoot me a message. Okay. I'm Stephen Ewan on Twitter and otherwise LinkedIn. Fantastic. I'm the guy that looks like me. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Stephen, for chatting with us on the Robert Show. Such a pleasure and uh, great talks that you've done at Flink Forward 2020. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today.